Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about times where the scriptures became very real to us, and as a result, we're able to draw more power from them into our lives. And what could we need more than that? I'm your host, Kerry Mulestein, and today we're doing a short cast, just where I talk about one topic very briefly uh, and focus on that topic, and hopefully it's helpful for you and you get something out of it. Today, we are going to talk about the... uh, the symbols of Christ that we find in the Joseph story. And uh, before we get into talking about um, Joseph himself as a symbol of Christ, I just want to touch lightly on something that I know I mentioned in my interview with uh, Joe Spencer, but it's worth thinking about because I think it's so powerful. And that's the symbol that Judah plays. And Judah, of course, is the ancestor of Christ. Uh, The symbol that Judah plays where we have someone who when Joseph, uh, who's still in disguise at this point, says that he's going to keep Benjamin and imprison him, Judah says to Joseph, and I'm paraphrasing, but intentionally so, he says to him, I promised my father I would bring this boy home. And even though it seems like he did something wrong, I am going to bring him home. Keep me, have me pay the price for what he has done wrong and send this boy back to his father. I told his father I would do it, and I'm going to. That is what Christ did. It is such a powerful symbol of Christ in my mind, and I think that's worth thinking about and understanding. Now, we're going to talk most of the the time, the rest of the time, about Joseph as a symbol of Christ and, and how he serves as this symbol in so many ways. I want to point out uh, that if you were to go to my website, outofthedust.org, so it's all one word, outofthedust.org, when you get there, you will find a link that says Old Testament AIDS, and if you were to click on Old Testament AIDS, um, and again, this is not a beautiful uh, setup because I designed it myself and I'm not good at it, but and I really don't have the time to put into it, but if you were to look at that, at the top of that page, you find um, uh, firesides and, and podcasts and things like that that you can listen to. Um, but if you keep scrolling down, then you find helpful videos, um, maps, and helpful charts or handouts. And so just as an example, we've got um, Adam as a symbol of Christ, statements about the fall, symbolism in Abraham's test. These are all charts. And the one we're going to talk about today is Joseph as a symbol of Christ. I'm going to talk about more than what is on that chart, and, and hopefully we go more into depth than what is on this chart. But you can find this chart uh, and lots of others that talk about, in this particular one, Joseph serving as a symbol of Christ. And so let's talk about how Joseph does that. Um, Just to to begin with, we're going to say Joseph is loved by his father. Uh, And of course, we know that Christ is the the beloved of God. Um, And then when um, Jacob wants to send Joseph out to find his brothers and make sure he's okay, they're they're okay, and you can see the symbolism there. Um, When Jacob asks uh, Joseph to do that, Joseph responds with saying, here am I. Uh, And that's the same thing that Christ responds with in pre-mortality when the father asks, who will will go and save your your brothers and your sisters? And Christ says, here am I. Uh, I think it's uh, there's something really powerful about that. Uh, also, when Joseph goes to help his brothers instead of or to make sure that they're OK, they even though he's there for their good out of jealousy and base motives, they instead turn on him and betray him, which is exactly what happens to Christ. The very people whom he is trying to save turn on him and betray him. Uh, Joseph was promised that he would become a great ruler, and of course, that was promised about Christ as well. Um, uh, I've already mentioned this in a way, but but uh, to get more specific, Joseph, when he goes to his brothers, he's betrayed by them, and they strip him of his garment, and that actually happens with Christ as well. He is betrayed by one whom he he calls a brother, Judas, and then he is stripped of his garments. Uh, and they're they're gambled for and so on. Now, Judah sells Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Uh, He sells him as a slave, so that's obviously the going price of a slave. He sells him for 20 pieces of silver. Another one named Judah, Judas is Greek for Judah, 
uh, sells Christ for 30 pieces of silver, which we understand is the going price of a slave in that day. And so they're both sold for the price of a slave. And I, I hope you can see some of the deep symbolism in there that uh, as we sell ourselves into slavery, bondage to sin, then Christ delivers us by himself being sold for the price of a slave and betrayed for the price of a slave, just as Joseph did. Um, I think uh, it's th th there are just so many things. If you go through this story thinking uh, in terms of, of what it means for your life, and, and we could uh, talk about that as well, the symbolism in your life where Joseph uh, serves God at all hazards and at all costs, even when it seems like things are not going well for him. Uh, and sometimes it seems like he's punished for obedience. Right. When he does the right thing, he's punished for it, and yet he stays true to God. And we can tell he stays true to God, even though it doesn't say specifically he does. Uh, you can tell he does because even so, immediately in each situation he's put in, after things go wrong, uh, immediately he's being blessed as a covenant keeper, and all around him is blessed as a covenant keeper. And so that would say that he's keeping his covenant. Um, and uh, I find that very interesting. Now, Joseph is tempted uh, with great sin when uh, Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him, and he refuses that sin, just like Christ is uh, tempted by Satan. Uh, we call it the Mount of Temptation, but he's tempted with great sin, and he refuses it. Um, Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and Christ was falsely accused before the Sanhedrin. And to me, this is some of the, the great difficulty is to be falsely accused. I don't think anything hurts more than being falsely accused when you're trying to do everything right. And then you're accused. And, and in the case of both of them, you're accused of that thing which you specifically did not do. Right? Joseph is imprisoned for trying to sleep with Potiphar's wife when he was actually doing everything he could to not sleep with Potiphar's wife. Christ in the end, is killed for, he's accused of any number of things, but what they're really killing him for is claiming to be the son of God, or well, let's put it this way, he's killed for blasphemy, and that blasphemy is that he claims to be the son of God. He is the one person who is incapable of blasphemy on that count. It's not blasphemy for the son of God to claim he's the son of God, and so the irony in, in this false accusation is just so painful, and I always remember uh, Elder Maxwell talking about how irony is the crust on the bread of adversity. It's just when it makes it really, really hard. Uh, so we have that, that interesting thing. Uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he began his life's work, and uh, Christ was 30 years old when he began his life's work. Uh, I also find it interesting that Joseph when he has the opportunity to interpret dreams, he doesn't take the credit for himself, but he gives the credit to God. It's not God the one who gives interpretation of dreams. Christ constantly and consistently turns the credit to the Father. You say, there's no, don't call me good. There's no, not one who is good, but, or there's only one who is good, and that is the Father. And, and always he's saying, I only do what the Father does. I only would act the way the Father acts. And he gives glory to the Father again and again. And so I think that's a really Im important element here. Uh, and that even when uh, things go wrong, they're both determined to serve the Lord uh, is a powerful element in this story. Uh, Joseph, interestingly, is raised to a position of power, um, and he he gives credit to God. I think one of the more powerful uh, verses in this story is when uh, he tells his brothers that they shouldn't feel bad. It's not really them who sent him to, uh, to Egypt. It was God who sent him to Egypt so that he could save them. And Christ always keeps in mind that it's the Father who sent him. And that everything that's happening, it's because it's the Father's will, and He is willing to do the Father's will, and and that's that's pretty important stuff. Uh, further, when Joseph is raised to this position of power, and then uh, his brothers who betrayed him come to his presence, he has the opportunity to punish them, but he doesn't. Christ also could punish those who were crucifying him, but instead he forgives them. They both forgive the very people who betray them and whom they are in the process of saving, uh, they forgive them, though they could have brought great punishment upon them. I, I think that's also really important to think about. Um, we'll keep going. 
Joseph saves his family from destruction. They would die from the famine, but Joseph saves his family from that. And Christ also saves all of mankind from destruction uh, and from, from death and hell, that kind of destruction, right? So again, this is a, a striking parallel. And I hope that we'll, as we go through these lists of things, and we know the Joseph story well enough that it will allow us to better identify with Christ. It's when I think about these little real elements and what happened for each of these people that uh, it, the story becomes real enough to help me understand Christ better. Joseph gathers an estranged house of Israel to himself, right? He's been estranged from his family, the house of Israel, the family of Israel. He's been estranged from them, but then he gathers them in and gives them the opportunity to be saved, just as Christ is working on gathering an estranged house of Israel to himself. They have cut themselves off from him by breaking the covenant, or I, I can say we, but he is gathering us in so that we will no longer be estranged, but we can be one with him and part of his household and be saved. Joseph serves in prison, but is then elevated to being the Egyptian king's second in command. And Christ actually goes to spirit prison uh, and then is elevated to being on the right hand of God. Uh, people from many nations bowed before Joseph and all people will bow before Christ. Uh, Jacob sent his son, Benjamin, whom he loved. And in return, he had Joseph, who was dead to him, restored to him. And God sends his beloved son, and in return has restored to him all of his children who had, would be captive to death and are captive to death until the resurrection takes effect in their lives. Joseph suffered greatly from being separated from his father. You get this uh, idea again and again when he keeps asking how his father is, and then when he can reveal himself, he asks again how his father is, and he weeps. And when he sees his father again, he weeps. And you just get the feeling for how difficult this is for Joseph. Let's stop and think about this. Joseph is about 17 when he uh, is sold into slavery. Um, and he is then 30 when he is raised to being uh, the uh, second in command, the vizier in Egypt. So if I do my math right, that's uh, 13 years in between. Uh, is that right? So yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then he uh, were seven years, were, were through seven years of good years and two bad years by the time he starts to be reunited with his, his family. So that's nine more years. So uh, 13 plus nine is 22. So he has been in Egypt and away from his father longer than he was ever with his father. By the time he sees his father again, he's been separated from his father because of betrayal longer than he had ever been with his father. This is a painful thing for Joseph. And yet Joseph uh, endures it with this amazing attitude of saying, it's really God who sent me to save you. Uh, and it's really God who, who has made this possible. I think that's fantastic. It's also worth stopping for just a moment to think about what is going on with this uh, whole story where Joseph is, is uh, pretending that he doesn't know his brothers and, and so on. And it seems to me, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that he's trying to find out if they've really changed. If he reveals who he is uh, while he's in this position of power, uh, of course, they're going to seem like they changed. And I think he wants to really know. And so he, he kind of creates this little test where he can find out what kind of people they are. And he overhears them talking about how they, they feel terrible about the, the pain that he went through and the pain that Jacob went through. Um, but it's really when he can see how Judah has changed that he reveals himself, because I think at that moment he sees what he's been hoping to see, that they're different people. And, uh, and that allows him to have a different relationship with him than if he doesn't know that. And so that's, that's wonderful. But in any case, Joseph suffers from being separated from his father. And it's clear that Christ also suffered from being separated from his father. And uh, he really just wanted to be with his father again. Uh, so that he can say that he commends his, his spirit into his father's hands um, when he had, it is finally finished for him. Uh, so along those lines, uh, after great trial, they're both reunited with their fathers. I love to think about what that reunion looked, about, looked like for Jacob and Joseph when Joseph goes out to meet Jacob at the end of Jacob's long journey and they fall on each other's necks and they weep and weep. And that helps me picture what it must have been like 
when Christ is finally able to return to the Father and, and uh, all that Christ has been through and how much the Father must have hated seeing him go through what he went through. And yet the union that they have, because the, in a way they did this together, even as they were separate from each other and what that reunion would have looked like. Uh, I, I like to picture that. That's a touching thing for me. And picturing the Joseph story helps me picture that better. They both end up giving their family an inheritance. Joseph uh, is able to create a place where the house of Israel will live. And Christ is the one who prepares a place for us to live in the, in the mansions of his father. And so they, they both make that possible. Uh, those are just a couple of elements. I'm sure there are more, and I hope you'll mind the story a little bit more and find even more for yourself. But I think it's worth thinking about how much we can understand Christ, his father, the house of Israel, and our relationship with him by seeing elements of that in the Joseph story and it, how Joseph is a shadow or a symbol or a type of Christ. That's a, a beautiful and powerful thing that I hope um, just brings us all the closer to our Father in Heaven and uh, increases our ability to experience the delivering power of His Son. And I'd encourage you to just dive into that scriptural story and tear apart the text and uh, have fun doing that for yourself. And as you do so, I hope the scriptures are more real and you experience more power. Thank you. Thank you.